It is going to be one of the jewels of the One Belt, One Road plan. A mega port in northern Myanmar, where Chinese oil and cargo will now be offloaded and sent to China on pipelines and roads. Jiaoping is a special economy zone. It's the gate to the Indian Ocean, the only way to the Indian Ocean for China. But the Chinese mega project sits in Rakhine State, home of the Rohingya people, and site of the biggest humanitarian crisis in Asia. I think generally the local population is worried that their government is not capable of managing Chinese investment for the benefit of the Myanmar people. Chinese projects have brought investment, electricity, jobs. But it has also been met with protests and controversy. Hi, I'm Anthony, and I've been covering stories on China Silk Road for the past four years. But this particular episode is very personal for me. My parents are originally from Myanmar. They met and eventually had us four kids. And even though we were raised in Thailand, I've been coming back to this country for the past three decades. So I'm very excited to take you along with me on this journey to my homeland. My first stop, a place that is of utmost importance on the global Silk Road. A rural town that will soon undergo dramatic transformation. So there's black gold down there, huh? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I can definitely smell the oil. Myanmar is one of the world's oldest oil producers exporting its first barrel in 1853. Despite its early start, production has been negligible here. Now, Profound change is about to come to Oil Mountain. Today, I'm going to meet U Tun Chi. He is taking me to his home in Madei Island, where he is the chairman of the Development Association. Donji, good morning. Hi, good morning, good morning. Hi, I'm Anthony. Yes, sir. Nice to meet you. His family has lived here for three generations. In 2011, thousands of Chinese workers descended on the sparsely populated island he lives on. And they have come for this. What's that over there? This is China National Petroleum Corporation's oil and gas installation that cost 2.45 billion US dollars. From here, there is a 771 kilometer long underground oil and gas pipeline stretching to China. The gas pipeline started operations in 2013, and Chinese press reported that it can carry 12 billion cubic meters of gas to China annually. 
The sister oil pipeline started in 2017 and can carry up to 440,000 barrels of crude oil per day. Oil Mountain's output of several barrels a day is a mere drop compared to the oil tsunami that is coming to Chaopu's shores. China, a vast mainly inland empire, has always looked for outlets to the sea for its landlocked western and southwestern provinces. The policy began as far back as the 18th century. Today, the Chaopu Corridor gives China access to South and Southeast Asia, as well as the entire Indian Ocean region. This utmost strategically important sea access has now finally been realized for China here. Nearly 80% of China's oil imports, which comes from the Middle East and Africa, used to have to sail through the Straits of Malacca. Now, these twin crude and gas pipelines are key to China's two ocean strategy, to diversify energy supply away from the choke point of the Straits of Malacca. When fully operational, it is expected to supply 6% of China's annual needs. Many believe it will impact petrochemical businesses in Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia. The completion of the project was celebrated in China. But here at Madei Island, the project provoked a different reaction. The Myanmar Ministry of Energy was responsible for compensating the people affected by this mega project. But U Tun Chi says this has not been done. How did the people in your village respond to the developments here? ซาดุวะโดยโลงกันจีเดลาลุเดซุโรจนอเดดะคันเนี่ยมะยีพวนพุยโดยจนอเนี่ยโลงเกะมะยีโลงเกะเนี่ยดาเมะเอ่อผิ
I'm traveling on China Silk Road in Jiaopiu, Myanmar. And this fishing town is about to be transformed radically. A huge petrochemical facility has already been built, and now work will soon commence on a deep sea port and a special economic zone. I want to see for myself where the special economic zone will be located. So I hit the roads. Well, I'm finally here. I see a few huts, a lot of agricultural land, and it's hard to believe that a special economic zone is going to end up here. Mingwa Ba? Hi, hi, hi. How are you guys doing? <laughs> U Tun U's family lives in the area that is demarcated for the special economic zone. Though Chinese media reported that work will begin in 2016, the project has faced many delays. Do you know anything about the special economic zone that's going to be here? So what are your hopes for this special economic zone when it finally materializes? These farmers may not have felt much impact, but China Silk Road has already brought major changes to another community here in Chaopiu. Jiaopiu has a population of 45,000, and many of them rely on the sea for a living. The arrival of the oil tankers who need to pass through fishing ground has caused concern. So how have all these Chinese developments here, how have they affected you? <laughs> But there are also those amongst them that are eagerly anticipating the future. It may be some time before the special economic zone and deep sea port takes shape in this fishing town. First, China and Myanmar disagree over the ownership structure. Chinese developer Sitik had initially asked for an 85% stake in the Jiaopiu project. The Myanmar government wanted a bigger stake. Many in Myanmar cite the Japanese-led Dilawa Special Economic Zone as an example, whereby Myanmar owns 51%, while Japan owns 49%. There are also the geopolitical considerations. Jiaopiu is almost directly opposite INS Varsha, where the Indian Navy will base its new fleet of nuclear submarines. Jiaopiu will be the fourth and last Chinese-controlled port in the area. A Myanmar government official told Bloomberg News that military attaches from the US, India, and other ASEAN countries have expressed concern over militarization of the area. In the past, Chinese warships have docked in the Maldives, Pakistan, and also in Sri Lanka. Finally, there's the Rohingya crisis. Jiaopiu is located in Rakhine State, the site of Asia's biggest humanitarian disaster in recent times. 
Ong Shin is the editor of Myanmar Times, one of the most respected newspapers in the country. And he tells me investment inflows have come to a near stop due to the Rohingya crisis. How do you think the Rohingya crisis will impact developments in Jiaopu? I just uh, has been to the Jiaopu. It's really huge, I mean, really potential. But so far, nothing have done yet for the uh, special economic zone, state discussing. How this uh, uh, the Rohingya crisis impact? Of course, the, uh, <laughs> this, this country, uh, the whole country uh, right now, you know, every, uh, the whole the economy is uh, impacted by the Rohingya crisis because the investors, they are listening and closely watching all the time, right? What is that really happening? Though there hasn't been violence reported in Chaopu, the sheer fact that it is located in Rakhine State complicates matters. Apart from the Chinese, it has been difficult to rally other investors. There are many challenges here, but it is unlikely these problems will get in the way of China's mega plan. The new Silk Road strategy features six economic corridors connecting China to the world, and Myanmar plays a significant role in two out of these six corridors. The first corridor starts from Kunming in southern China, passing through Myanmar and Bangladesh through to Kolkata in India. It features a combination of road, rail, water, and air linkages with a total estimated cost of 22 billion US dollars. The second corridor is the China-Indochina Peninsula Corridor. This features nine cross-national highways linking all of Indochina. It also envisions a railway that plans to connect China to countries across Southeast Asia down through to Singapore. This railway is still at various stages of negotiation with the different countries. These two major corridors join a network of four other corridors on China's Belt and Road Plan, connecting China to Europe, China to Iran and Turkey, China to Mongolia and Russia, and China to Pakistan. China has incredible political will to implement its Belt and Road Plan. So whatever the challenges are here in Jiaopu, it is unlikely to hold the mighty tide of change. Zhao Pu will join a host of other Myanmar cities with strong Chinese influence. Amongst them, the old capital, Mandalay. <laughs> this looks like a scene you will see in any city in China. But it is actually Mandalay, Myanmar's second largest city and former royal capital. There's the Chinese aerobics, fashion apparel stores, Huawei phone shops, and also a lively Chinese culinary scene. According to official figures, there are 400,000 ethnic Chinese in Mandalay province. They form almost half of the population of one million in this city. The Chinese imprint goes beyond the signboards and shops. Many of Mandalay's shopping centers, condominiums, and hotels are Chinese-owned. Mandalay remains a hub for largely Chinese-traded jade and gemstones, as well as smartphones, motorbikes, and other imported goods. We had the opportunity to spend a few days in Mandalay, and there we saw the influence of Chinese uh, community there, um, from the buildings, hotels, Chinese businesses. How important has Chinese investment been for the city of Mandalay? Uh, Myanmar from, uh, isolated for many years, so no project at all. For most of the, uh, the, uh, the, the consume they use every day was the uh, imported by China. So if you are a businessman in Mandalay, you just do it. There's something imported from the China easy way, and you sell in the Mandalay. In that way, the, the Chinese businessmen, they can have from the, the China. The other thing is there are many the Chinese people, they pawn into the, especially the Mandalay area, some years ago, 10 years ago. They bought a land. So if you look at the whole city, right, more than half area or the Mandalay city belong to the China, Chinese people right now. Going along with that, I've also heard that if you want to do business in Mandalay, 
you pretty much need to have a Chinese connection or speak Chinese. Is that true? Yes, that's true. That's true. China and Myanmar have deep historical ties. The roots of it goes back to a violent period in Myanmar's history. Since the 1950s, Myanmar's various ethnic armed groups, like the Kachin, the Karen, the Shan, and the Wa, have been fighting the military junta. This has been the world's longest running civil war. The junta ruled over a brutal military regime for half a century. They locked up Aung San Suu Kyi in her own home for 15 years, imprisoned activists, and waged war against many ethnic groups. What was the relationship between the junta and China like between the 1980s and 90s? Papua relation. Papua means brotherhood. So like uh, China is a big brother, not yours. So whatever you need, your big brother will protect you, will help you. So the Chinese, your big brother, the only uh, friends, the only the investor. That's why most of the majority of the uh, state, the, uh, I mean, projects, all of them belong to the China. Former British ambassador Vicky Bowman has lived in Myanmar for 12 years and eventually married a local artist. The Myanmar expert shares her view on this Paupaw relations. Over the 90s, with the sort of gradual scaling back of any form of um, uh, Western investment because of a combination of the politics and, and sanctions, to some extent, China became the only choice that, that Myanmar had then as a partner. During that period, and I was here then as, as ambassador, the Chinese were, I think, not sort of just standing by. They were also actually trying to engage Myanmar and show it on a path to reform. China at the time, we're talking here, 2000s was taking members of the military regime off to um, Shenzhen, but also Yunnan to Kunming to show them pathways to economic development. Um, so they were certainly um, looking at this place as an extremely strategic um, option. A democratic transition started in Myanmar in 2012. The world celebrated the fact that Myanmar was finally open for business. But the truth is, that Chinese companies have been here since the 1980s, three decades before Aung San Suu Kyi was released from house arrest. Today, I'm going to meet Zhao Win, one of the most prominent Chinese Burmese businessmen in the country. Zhao Win is the man behind Mingala Mandalay. It's the city's biggest commercial development and includes shopping malls, villas, condominiums, shop houses, office towers, and what will be the city's most upmarket five-star hotel. Mingala Mandalay and two other major projects done by Chao Win's company will shape the new downtown of Mandalay. It's a massive undertaking that has already proven successful. There are many successful Burmese Chinese businessmen like yourself. What do you think are the factors that drive the success? Building the new downtown of Myanmar's second biggest city is a mammoth project. But the tycoon's ambitions extend further up north. Along the border of China is the city of Muse on the Myanmar side. Myanmar, China, two ancient countries are separated by Zhuali River. The site is located in the northwest side Mu City, a beautiful, untouched land, becoming an important business window for Myanmar and China business. Zhao Win has planned an entire town here. He has built roads, power lines, water facilities, and he's in the process of building the shops office towers, housing, villas, hotels. Basically everything that a government town planner would usually do, except that this is a private enterprise endeavor. Muse, currently a sparsely populated town, is the starting point 
of China Silk Road in Myanmar. I'd like to ask you about the Musei project because that's a huge show of confidence in the One Belt, One Road plan. General Musei project is 100% digital rapid job. General One Belt, One Road we now have a solution in general pega I don't want to see the people the one by one to own me move yeah he bought the young G mushy body but young as well do you know and then what I'm like he comes on you miss a she gave me your car I see body I can run and air the one by one to win by the team are there to run and get the guns on the duke about it Zhao Wen firmly believes China's Silk Road will bring more investments in these much-needed areas and contribute to development in Myanmar. As the Belt and Road progresses, Chinese businessmen and state-owned enterprises are building dams, hotels, bridges, and shopping complexes. They are trading in everything from fruits to timber to metals. But of all these, none is more monumental than the jade trade. Jade is huge business. But the jade trade has been linked to wars, environmental destruction, and a drug pandemic. It is 5 a.m., but business is already in full swing at the Mandalay Jade Market. Chinese traders are here looking for the prized heavenly stone, jade. The jade trade between Myanmar and China is worth an estimated 30 billion U.S. dollars a year. That is about half of Myanmar's GDP. This business with China affects thousands of lives in Myanmar and shapes public perception that ordinary Burmese people have of China. You see all these merchants shining their torches on the stone? It's how you check for the transparency and clarity of the best stones. The more transparent it is, the more expensive it is. Let's take a look at this one right here. And so they're shining the light and checking the quality of the stone. And that is why it's so important to come here to the market before the sun goes up. 5,000 to 8,000 people come here every morning to do business. Some Chinese buyers browse the stalls. Hundreds of other Chinese buyers sit around while Myanmar sellers present their stones. This simple looking market here is one of the most valuable gem trading hubs in the world. Wu Tan Win is the president of the Burmese Jade Traders Association. What about this piece here? How much would this cost? One lakh. Oh, one lakh. One lot. So about 80 US dollars. 80 US dollars. That's not too bad. Mm. Okay. Let's see what else we can find. Oh. What about this guy? Oh, it's pretty heavy. How much is this worth? Uh, 200 baht. In my guess. 20,000 US dollars? Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. I better be very careful then. Putting that down, I don't want to break it. Wow. So then all the transactions that are done here, all of them are done in cash, right? Yeah. That's amazing. That means there are thousands, thousands of dollars being circulated all around in the market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's check out the rest of the market. Yeah. Yeah? 90% mm -hmm. of the world's jade resources come from Myanmar. According to a report by London-based Global Witness, what's mined in Myanmar is worth more than 30 billion US dollars a year. A transformative amount of money if it were properly spent. So we're talking about a lot of money in the J trade. How are the people of Myanmar benefiting from this? Yeah. 
But there is a dark side to the jade trade. Myanmar journalist Nin Yadanaza has been following this story for over five years, and she has seen some horrific things. You've been to the jade mine several times. Can you tell me what you saw there? In Pagan, the jade mines, there was no tree or like it was really dusty. After several decades of Chinese business and the jade business came in, it became the place where it's really dry and the environment is really in bad situation. What about the workers there? There are two types of workers. One of them, uh, one is the Germany workers who work uh, full time, and the other type is the hand pickers. Most of the hand pickers don't have regular contact with their family members who are left in home. So when they die in landslides, the family members they don't even know that they already uh, die in the landslide. Landslides take place at the jade mines every few months. When the government tried to dig out the bodies from the site, which collapsed because of the machine, uh, it is really hard to know who is who because uh, the, the machines rip apart the bodies and also like the bodies are already decomposed. That sounds absolutely horrific. Drug addiction among poor miners is also a major problem. Miners take heroin to ease muscle pain, and many get addicted. The problems in the jade mines are well known in Myanmar. There are many problems associated with the jade trade. Land grabs, slave labor, drug addiction. Do you think that the Chinese should take more responsibility for these issues? Of course they should, because they are the, the only two who buy out, right? The jade mining mostly done by the, uh, the Chinese company. All these ones, none of them never have any knowledge about the uh, responsible business or CSR or whatever. For many decades, they didn't care. Yeah, they don't know it because nobody tell us. So the Chinese government over the last 10 years or so has come out with a number of guidelines around environmentally and socially responsible investment, sort of going out guidelines and, and so on. My observation from here is that they seem to be somewhat stuck in Beijing. Um, they are not even filtering down to some of the Chinese SOEs who are here, let alone small private sector Chinese companies who are involved in, in the jade trade. For a business that is worth 30 billion US dollars a year, the jade trade has the potential to bring transformational benefits to Myanmar. But in its current form, it is a blood-stained business. As the Silk Road progresses, there are more calls for socially responsible investment. The Myanmar government is now looking at more regulations around the jade trade, and many locals hope the Chinese government will also step in to punish errant Chinese companies. China is keenly aware that the perception of the new Silk Road goes beyond mere infrastructure projects and special economic zones. And that's why there's been a charm offensive happening in Myanmar. Today, I'm headed to the China-Myanmar Friendship Association. And here to show me around is the vice chairman. There are several China-Myanmar Friendship Associations in the country, and this one in Mandalay is the largest. A museum was opened here in 2017 to educate the public on China-Myanmar ties. So it's a Burmese legend that goes back several hundred years. Yes. It's beautiful. Thank you. 
。我们缅甸的国务资政昂山素举两次访问中国，我们的总统也访问了中国。So this is an example of the relationship at a government to government level. So I guess what you guys are doing is more at the grassroots level. 是啊，我们是民间关系嘛。哎，老百姓嘛咯，正如你只有把大家看明白一点，这个道理，普尼教你，古文教你嘛，把大家看点点的乎，来比如。I've seen impressive infrastructure projects along China's Silk Road, but what really stands out for me is seeing how much effort China has put into promoting goodwill all over the world. Soft power complements hard infrastructure on the new Silk Road, and here is a spectacular example of China's infrastructure spending in Myanmar. I am traveling on China's New Silk Road, and I'm in Myanmar. It is a key site for large-scale Chinese projects, including the dams, ports, roads and bridges that are the concrete and steel manifestation of the One Belt, One Road plan. Completed in 2007, the Yadanaban Bridge connects North and South Myanmar. The company responsible was CAMC Engineering, a Chinese state-owned company. Before it was built, big trucks needed to cross using a river barge. The old bridge, built by the British, wasn't strong enough to support the weight of these vehicles. Just looking at the landscape here, it tells the story. Over there, you see the pass. Built by the British during its colonial glory days in the 1930s, it is now a dated piece of infrastructure. And over here, the future. The modern technological marvel provided by China and its Silk Road. This is a massive bridge, and I'm sure there were challenges while building it. Can you share a little bit about that? So if you had to import all the steel from China, that must have been difficult given the road conditions at the time. Uh,是的,这运输对于我们来说确实比较困难。我们是选择了海运到阳光港之后呢,我们又转到内陆河,通过一楼大底江用船运过来。其他的困难的话,在海外,剑桥我们用了一个非常特殊的施工方法,就是
the Yandanaban Bridge was one mega Chinese project. Here is another, Yewa Dam. It is one of the largest dams in the country, and it provides electricity for the city of Mandalay. Dams are controversial in Myanmar, but not this one here at Yewa. Environmentalist Mao Mao Wu explains how Yewa not only generates electricity, but also prevents flooding and natural disasters. Yewa is just one of dozens of major dam projects that China is involved in in ASEAN. In Myanmar, China has planned eight major dams. In Cambodia, it is building three. In Laos, it is building seven. In Vietnam, one. And in Malaysia, two. These do not include the dozens of other minor dams they're building. Of all these dams, one of the largest is the Mietson Dam located in Kachin State. Chinese officials said that it will bring renewable energy to Myanmar, but it has faced strong opposition. The ferocity of reaction against the dam surprised even the Chinese. In 2010, a series of bombs struck the dam's construction site, killing and injuring Chinese workers. Fresh rounds of fights also broke out between rebel Kachin separatists and the Myanmar army over the dam. If we can look at the Mitson Dam in particular, what are the issues surrounding it? If we think about where Mitson is being proposed, it's where the Eowane actually forms. Eowane, which is the most important river in Myanmar, and is providing livelihoods to millions of people. Putting the dam right there will obviously have a lot of impacts for people living downstream, but also for the ecological functioning of the river, for fish migration, for ensuring that there's sufficient water downstream during the dry season. A People's Daily report in early 2014 said China had invested at least 700 million yuan in the project by the time it was halted. China's ambassador to Myanmar visited the dam site in 2016 and proposed several solutions to the deadlocked project. One, cancel the dam and pay $800 million in compensation. Resume work and earn $500 million a year when it is completed. Or do nothing and pay $50 million in interest every year. The decision is a daunting task for Myanmar's leader, Aung San Suu Kyi who risks angering China if she cancels the project, or the public if she lets it go forward. As of 2018, the Mietson Dam still remains in limbo. The Mietson Dam may have been halted, but more than a dozen other Chinese dams in Indochina threaten the mighty Mekong River and its tributaries. It has already become a political issue in Indochina. 60 million people depend on the Mekong for their food and livelihood. Their ways of lives have evolved over generations, in tandem with the annual monsoon rains and the rise and fall of the water. I just hope it won't be all swept away in the great flood of progress. Of course, there are no real easy answers here. I'm a big fan of green energy, but if it's at the expense of 60 million lives, then we've really got to stop and think about that. Dams, new towns, roads, bridges, mines, and museums. China's Belt and Road is one big belt and an enormous road, one that will encircle and possibly entwine Myanmar. The Chinese government has firm ideas about how Myanmar fits into its bold global master plan and its two economic corridors. 
The question is, how Myanmar will respond? What are your thoughts on China Silk Road? ကျွန်တော်တို့ကတော့ဒီနိုင်ငံကြားရင်းနှင်းမြုံတယ်မှုဒေသတခုဖွံ့ပြုတဲ့ကျွန်စိုးပါတယ်နိုင်ငံကြ